Port Angeles bills itself as the authentic Northwest. One of the structures representing this authenticity is the former Port Angeles Fire Hall. Completed in 1931, the Art Deco Fire Hall was intended to serve as part of a city government campus. This building was to be the fire department and then there was to be a building facing the street that was City Hall and then there was another building that was the police department. But Depression era budgets squashed that plan, leaving the fire hall to multitask as the city council chambers and the city jail. So this became where we're standing. This was the fire department. Upstairs was the city council chambers and around back was the police department. Everyone came here and this was the pride of Port Angeles. Although the fire department relocated to a larger facility by the early 1950s, the building retained its utility, later serving as the city's first YMCA, the city sanitation department, a senior center, and until closing in the mid 2000s, a cafe. I'd like to see maybe some sort of a community gathering spot, something that takes advantage of the historic district. This would be really uh, a good area for a group of lawyers to come in because they are right next door to the courthouse. Challenges do exist for reuse of the fire hall. The cost for Shell and Core upgrades are over a million dollars alone. To spend that kind of money for restoration here, it would take a partnership to find somebody to put the money into it is a challenge. Undaunted, city and county officials continue to champion rehabilitation. Historic buildings traditionally give a lot of ambiance and a lot of culture to a community. This building is on the National Historic Register. It's too precious to lose. We need to restore it and we need to use it and we want to put it back into our community. Returning the fire hall to active use would complement the dramatic effect the Port Angeles Downtown Association has had on revitalizing the city's Main Street business core. We couldn't build what's here now. And to have that just enriches the place. It doesn't make it look like every other downtown. It's our downtown because it's historic to where we are. The town of Sprague began as a sheep camp in the 1870s. In 1895, a fire virtually erased downtown, prompting the construction of modern fireproof masonry buildings. Yet decades of deferred maintenance have taken a toll. On September 6th of last year, the easternmost building on the main block of downtown collapsed, forcing city officials to close down the street and condemn the entire block of adjacent structures. When this building came down, it traveled almost 100 feet out because it, it, it pushes out as it's coming down. So safety is a main concern. After that, we want to see the rebuild. Although property owners have been cleared to reoccupy their buildings, only one of four businesses has returned. Worse, additional businesses on adjoining blocks have shut their doors, stemming from the prolonged street closure. This is the community's commercial district. So this is where the bank is and the grocery store and the post office and, and Raylan's Bar and Grill. And for four months, Main Street was completely closed. Four businesses had to move out, only one has reopened. And that's a significant loss for a community of this size. Well, I was closed down in September, so therefore I had no business between September and now. I was told I had to move because uh, my building might be condemned. So I moved everything out. Now I'm having to move everything back. Debris from the collapsed building has been contained but remains piled high at the site. City officials and business owners haven't given up, but locating willing investors remains a challenge as Sprague's population now stands below 500. The block of buildings that remain constitute the historic core of the town. For the town to realize its hopes of economic revitalization, it is imperative for these buildings to be put back into active service. I would like to see the town restored to its original glory days of around the turn of the century of 1900. Sprague is very well known for its fishing and its hunting and numerous other outdoor recreational opportunities. And the historic character of Sprague's downtown is a perfect fit for those activities. The first time I drove through this town, I looked at my husband and I said, if I, had, if I ever get rich, I'm going to own every building in this town and I'm going to turn it to the biggest antique store there is in the world. People don't realize when we lose our history, we've lost so much. We want to preserve because without our history and our downtown, this town could very well disappear. 
The Thayer Barn is the last remaining dairy barn standing within the Duval city limits in the Snoqualmie River Valley. 1934, the barn was shipped out from Sears and Roebuck, their barn catalog. And in 1935, they stopped doing the barn catalog. It was during the Depression and all built by hand. The Thayer Barn is significant to us because it is the last dairy barn within the city limits of Duval, Washington. Efforts to preserve the barn are not new. A decade ago, notice went out to the community that the property would be sold for redevelopment. A local group rallied to save the barn. Ten years ago, the Duval Foundation for the Arts led the community in raising money to move the barn. We were challenged by the city council to raise money and quickly, so we did that. So we still have that money. But the deal fell through, with the barn sitting untended since then. Earlier this year, the property did indeed sell, and plans for a housing development are moving forward. Project sponsors have shown a willingness to incorporate the barn into the new development, provided local advocates can come up with the needed funds. The scenario that is talked about and seems the most likely and we're hoping for is there will be a plat of about an acre, maybe a little bit more, designated for this. The city will own it. We'll put the barn on it and try to raise some money and get it functioning. The enthusiasm and the questions about the barn have never gone away. Everyone always asks, what's going on with the Thayer barn? Are we going to save it? At present, the biggest threat is time. Once permitting for the project is complete, redevelopment will go forward with or without the barn. And given the structure's level of deterioration, whether it would survive another rainy winter season remains a question. Given the age of the barn and, and what kind of condition it's in, the weather is a constant threat. We see it as a place for, for gallery space, a display place for local art and classes, music. We have a very active uh, youth program of arts. The desired outcome is to create a community center for the citizens of Duval and the farmers and the artists. It has been done and it has been done successfully. It's so unique and yet it speaks to the valley, so there's, there's both sides, you know. It speaks to the history and the people that have been here before. It supports the arts and I think it would just be a, a centerpiece. Founded in 1854 along Willapa Bay in Pacific County, Oysterville's collection of intact structures, some over 150 years old, were added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1976. So you've got rural Gothic, and then you've got some that are more vernacular, but they're all here because of oystering. The old streets are still here. They're now grassy lanes, but you can see the original layout of the town. My father said when he first came here in 1930 that there was a special feeling about Oysterville. Yet the town's success as a historic district has created other challenges, with a high volume of new construction witnessed in recent years. It matters greatly what the new architecture looks like and what um, changes to the buildings look like as far as fitting in and blending with what's here. A local design review board is in place to ensure the buildings blend with the surrounding historic character, but some integrity has been lost. Tension has risen at times with one property owner suggesting the community would be better off without historic designation. Having citizens of the community judging the plans of other people, it's uncomfortable for me to be in the position of, of being a judge, being on that board. That part of it makes me wish, gosh, I wish this had never been called a historic district. Complicating matters, Pacific County, which has jurisdiction over the district, has been unable to intervene when violations have occurred. County officials recognize the district's importance, but have neither the budget nor the staff needed to address the situation. The most concerning example is a recent demolition of the Captain Stream House. Responding to perceived irreparable damage, the county approved demolition of the structure without input from the local design review board. Those concerned with the long-term integrity of the district hope to see the county play a larger role in helping to support historic preservation in Oysterville. I think that some help and backup from the county would be really important. Another thing is we have no expertise available to the Design Review Board and to the county itself to help with historic preservation. I do think one of the pluses since we became a National Historic District is that other people on the Long Beach Peninsula have started to take pride in Oysterville. I guess the, the worst case scenario would be you have a lot of recently constructed buildings that really don't seem to have 
ties to the setting and losing the, the character of the historic district. My goal would be to keep us an historic district. These buildings and this community should outlast all of us. Listed in the National Register of Historic Places, the Enchanted Valley Chalet is a two and a half story hand-hewn log structure built in 1931. It's completely unique not only in its architecture but it, in its location and at the very heart of Olympic National Park. When you walk into the valley itself the thing opens up and it's just uh, you're awestruck. By 1953 the National Park Service purchased the cabin and it continues to serve as a ranger station within Olympic National Park. When Olympic National Park was created it had four lodges the size of Enchanted Valley Chalet Enchanted Valley Chalet is the only one remaining. The threat stems from the east fork of the Quinault River, which shifted course over the winter, leaving one side of the chalet cantilevered over the riverbank. Advocates hope the building can be safely relocated within the valley away from the river. With about six helicopter trips for shuttling in the heavier supplies of the steel beams, we're going to actually push it unified with cylinders on skid shoes with ivory bar soap rubbed on the rails, and we'll slide it. To safety. But park officials are considering other options given that the chalet sits within a designated wilderness area. The Wilderness Act itself says it in no manner lowers the standards of preservation. Because it's been designated a wilderness, you can't shut the people and just do away with all the history of the past. That's wrong. In the meantime, supporters note that the chalet's location within the Enchanted Valley is a key component of its significance. Can you move Enchanted Valley Chalet out of Enchanted Valley and retain its historic significance? I think not. I wouldn't think they'd want to move it out of the valley. No, that would destroy the whole, the whole idea of it being there. Well, I certainly would like to see it preserved and kept in the valley. And I'm sure there's a lot more life left in that building. When we value wilderness and we, we hike up Enchanted Valley, we are walking in the footsteps of those who built Enchanted Valley Chalet. And it's because of them that Olympic wilderness has been preserved for us today.